Hey folks, it's JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 45, Awful Lot of Blood. We're going to hear the statement of C.R. Summers, what he did when he was inside the house. Be sure and hit that subscribe button. Also, you get a chance, go down to the description, click on the link, follow my podcast, follow me on Twitter, buy a copy of my book, copy of the documentary, visit the Facebook site, or my website. Uh, it's going to be a statement of C.R. Summers relative to the hostage situation at 2239 Shannon. Officer Summers, how long have you been employed by the Memphis Police Department? 13 and a half years. What is your present assignment, TAC unit? How long have you been assigned to the TAC unit? Seven years. What are your duties in the TAC unit? Bolt and scope, M16 and shotgun man on assaults. January 13, 1983, did you have an occasion to be part of the assault team in regards to a hostage situation at 2239 Shannon? Yes, sir. Explain what your duties were on the assault team on this particular occasion and also what you observed and what actions you took as a member of this team. I was the last minute substitute on the assault team. I was told I would be third man in. I was told to carry an M16, and I was to take and sweep from the rear of the house to the front of the house. After the assault had been made, staying primarily on the east side of the building. After the gas inversion was deployed, we entered and immediately received fire. I was on the right side, and at that time, a simulator came in somewhat late as I was advancing into what would be the den. As I was advancing up to the den, the simulator went off and I was tempor temporarily blinded. I was temporarily blinded. Went off awful close to me. I went down and stayed low. Shots were being fired. Momentarily, I recovered. I got back up. Moved to Officer Watson. He and I were to take the right side, which was the east side. And as we moved up, we came into a hallway. I don't think this hallway was on our map we had. Shots were fired from the hallway. Now he's referring to the southwest bed bedroom area. Officer Watson moved, jumped out of the way. I believe he returned fire. I fired into the room. Then we advanced forward into the kitchen area, and from the kitchen area, we advanced up to the bedroom on the northeast corner and then came into the living room. This is the first tack guy to actually describe the rooms he was going into. As we came into the living room, we saw Officer Hester. This time, Officer Watson and I advised the people outside, we've got the officer, we're coming out. We carried the officer outside and came back inside to sweep the house again, and double checked it. And as we came down the hallway, I believe it was Officer Watson and Rutherford, I believe they were fired at in another hallway off to my left. As they moved and I gave them cover fire, firing a couple of times in a room, he doesn't say which room. Then we moved back to the kitchen area and then I was told to check the master bedroom out again. This time I went to a closet and searched the closet area. Now he's referring to the southwest bedroom as the master bedroom. Went around to the back of the bed to see if I could see anything around the bed. Saw something behind the bed in the, directly in the back of it. I couldn't get to it from my position. I called for somebody to help me move the bed so we could check it out and see if someone was there. I, at that time, got up on the bed and saw a male black and the visibility was extremely poor due to all the smoke and gas. We had flashlights 
taped onto my M16. I saw a male black that was laying alongside the bed. I saw a pistol fired at this male black. I'm not sure. I think I shot two or three times at him. Picked up the pistol immediately and put it on top of the bed in case this subject was still alive. Then I checked under the bed to the place where I originally saw, I believe it was a blanket. I was called back outside. After we finished the sweep of the house, I was called back outside to put Officer Hester on a stretcher and place him in the ambulance. What type of weapon were you firing? M16. Do you know how many times you fired, how many rounds you fired from this weapon? I think I fired approximately 20 rounds. Is this an automatic weapon? Yes, sir, it is. When you first went into the house on the assault, what was the visibility of the house? As I stated before, there was a lot of smoke. We had three of us had our flashlights taped onto our rifles and shotguns and allowed very poor visibility due to all the smoke. There was also a couple of fires in there we had to extinguish. After entering the house and receiving fire, could you make out any type of person that was firing at you? Or did you see, or did you just see the muzzle blast? I really couldn't see anyone at that point. I was just in the two hallways providing cover and fire for Officer Watson. He's the one that was taking the rounds. To the best of your knowledge, how many people in the house were fatally wounded by you? One. Do you know how many people that was inside the house? No, I don't. I think I saw five. Then the officer, that would make six. Approximately how far away were you from the person that was wounded fatally by you and you fired at him? He was on the floor, partially hid by the bed, and we had already determined when we get ready to check these beds out, we we're going to jump on them and see if they would crash the bed. Somebody hollered, we'd move, and it would be a whole lot safer than if we did it that way than to stick the flashlight under it and look under the bed. So I jumped up on top of the bed, and when I did, that's when I seen the guy. I would say the approximate distance from the suspect to me was right at three feet. When you first saw Officer Hester, what was his condition? He was handcuffed, his hands behind his back. He had an awful lot of blood around his head, appeared to be very still. He appeared to have any type bullet wound. That's nice. They want the TAC unit to conduct an autopsy. I did not see any, no, sir. Like I say, before the lighting conditions were so very poor, we had already predetermined that once we found the officer, if it wasn't going to put anyone in jeopardy, if we knew he was dead, we were going to try and get him out of there. We weren't in jeopardy since we had already made a sweep all the way to the front of the house, and we had a team standing by to take the officer out if we located him. We went out the front porch with him. Exactly where was Officer Hester's body lying? Uh, right about almost in front of the front door, maybe just a little bit to the west, a couple of feet to the west center by the front door. I think we even had to move him forward just a little bit so we could get the door all the way open so we could get him out. You stated he had wounds about his head. Were there any weapons found in the house that might have caused these wounds? Uh, just a waste of oxygen there. Yes, sir, I saw a large object briefly, just glancing at it. It appeared to be some type of wooden object, approximately three foot long, and it looked like maybe four or five inches around. I guess they want the TAC unit just to conduct the whole investigation for them. Were there any weapons found inside the house? The weapon I saw was the one that the suspect had that I shot. Was there any other type of police equipment found in the house? I did not see any. Prior to this assault on the house on Shannon Street, did you have any knowledge as to why Officer Hester had been taken hostage at this location? We were advised when we arrived on the scene that they had made a disturbance call and they were taken prisoners they went in. Later, we received information that it was a planned setup. Where this information came from is above me. I have no knowledge. 
We had also received information that Officer Turner had received, received a laceration to his scalp, and he was admitted to one of the local hospitals. We also were advised that one officer had been shot two times, one with a small caliber handgun, and then the perpetrators inside disarmed him and had taken his service revolver and attempted to shoot him at point-blank range in the head. Fortunately, it was a bad shot, struck him in the cheek, and he's going to live. In gathering the intelligence information regarding this situation, was there ever any mention of the owner of this house being somewhat of a gun nut and possibly did have several different types of guns in the house? Yes, sir. We were advised three particular points in regards to the suspect that lived there. One, that he may have had several different types of weapons in the house. Two, that he is on drugs and had been held up in the house since Saturday, taking some type of drugs with other people. And third thing we were advised was that he was some type of religious fanatic. After Officer Hester was taken hostage, did you have an occasion to hear any type of conversation inside the house between the persons that were in it and Officer Hester? Yes, sir. My duty as I arrived on the scene was to go to the house immediately west of the suspect's location with Officer Cockrell. Now, west side of the house, that would be the, the brick duplex. Where we stayed for the remainder, time up, to one hour prior to the assault. While we were there, I did on numerous occasions hear Officer Hester crying, begging for mercy. One time he begged them not to kill him. Very audible. Numerous cries for help. Oh, please God, please God, no. Things of that nature. This went on for quite some time. Somewhere around 3.30 in the morning, Officer Hester you could tell he was receiving a tremendous beating. From the moment in the house that they were in, it seemed like there was two people at the same time administering this beating, perhaps more, but at least two. Then approximately around 3.30, the cries got so intense, and it was obvious that the pain was so intense. It got to the point where the officer was extremely weak, his cries for help became very inaudible, and then around the 3.30 mark, it became silent as far as crying from the officer, and that was the last time I heard Officer Hester, Officer Hester's voice. However, we could hear the beating being administered for a good 10 minutes after that time. It was a real good 10 minutes that they continued beating him. I had a command radio that had a channel 10 frequency on it, and I switched to channel 10 because the perpetrators inside had one of the officer's radios, and we knew that they didn't have a channel 10, and I was given the command post information about what was going on inside the house during the entire ordeal to keep the suspects from being able to switch over to that frequency and hear the information. Now, when he's talking about it at 3.30 in the morning, he's talking about on the 12th, January the 12th. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this statement at this time? No. This concludes this statement. Then it's got a typewritten edition at the bottom, January 27, 1983. This one question will be asked by Sergeant D.R. Hawley on January 27, 1983. Troman Summers, did you fire any other weapon during the assault at 2239 Shannon other than your M16 rifle? No, sir. Folks, I'll say one thing that's consistent. They asked very few of these TAC guys that question. If you notice how many of these statements, they had to come back to ask a question that, that was pertinent at the beginning. Summers said when they made it through the back door, they received gunfire very consistent with the statement given by the other officers. They received gunfire from the den kitchen area and then received gunfire again from the southwest bedroom. Summer said he did return fire into the southwest bedroom. 
and that uh, him and Watson stayed along the right side of the house. Summers mentions he, that he went through the kitchen, no gunfire there, traveled through the northeast bedroom, then go into the living room and find Hester's body by the front door. All right, once they uh, get to the living room, they pick up Bobby Hester's body and carry it out the front door and lay him on the sidewalk. And then they come back in and sweep the house, a more thorough sweep. Now, after uh, they begin that second sweep, it, it's really confusing about which direction Summers went other than he went back southbound. He just mentions that Rutherford and, and Watson taking fire and returning fire and that he was providing cover fire for Watson. They did mention they fell back to the kitchen, just don't know which room they were firing in. Now we do know uh, Summers went to the southwest bedroom. We don't know how he got there. I'm, Thinking from the kitchen, he probably went through the den, went back westbound down the hallway into the southwest bedroom. We do know he checked the large closet, the same one that Hubbard and Ray had checked at the beginning. And then uh, he had uh, shot and killed a suspect hiding under the bed. Now he mentions that he had somebody help him move the bed, and then he jumped up on top of the bed. The investigators never asked him who was in that room with you when you fired at the suspect. In fact, if you notice from the statements, they don't seem to spend too much time asking any of the TAC guys who was with you when you fired shots. Was anybody else present when you fired shots? They, they just never ask. All right, folks, that's gonna wrap up this episode here. Got, uh, one tech officer left, and that's Watson. Number one man, first man through the door. After that, then we will probably look at uh, some things regarding the statements, why the quality of the statements is poor, and some other issues dealing with the statements. In fact, we may get a couple episodes out of that. There's some other things I want us to discuss before we um, start moving on to the crime scene and the autopsies, which, is, which will be coming up pretty soon. Anyways, folks, I do appreciate you. And as always, I'll see you down the road.